Um, next, I'm very excited to introduce you to Kathy Hempstead, um, who's here from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and who's going to be speaking about the role of evidence in a new era. She's the senior advisor to the executive vice president of Robert Wood Johnson and directs their work on coverage and also healthcare price transparency and value. And we're very thankful to the foundation, um, not only for their support of this initiative and events like this and some of the research that you'll learn about um, later today, but also because the foundation has been a real thought partner to us and I'm sure to many of you in the room in thinking about healthcare policy and thinking about creating a culture of health. So please help me welcome Dr. Hempstead. Thank you so much. Well, hello, everybody. Really glad to be here today. And I'm um, sort of giving a funders perspective on some of these issues. And as everyone who knows funders know, funders don't really like to give remarks as much as they like to get ideas. So I'm hoping to put a few things out relatively quickly. And then hopefully, I'll get some ideas from you all and, and learn some things that I'll uh, bring back to the mothership that will help us do some smart programming in the future. So I really want to talk about the way that uh, funders think about research and the way funders use research. And it's obviously a very important tactic for us. It's not the only thing that we fund. I think everything that we fund is somehow an attempt to increase the flow of information, either the quality, the quantity, the speed, whether it's technical assistance or convenings or whatever tactic we use. But research is obviously a very, very important tactic to, um, to funders. And there are a lot of different ways we support research. Today, we're really talking about you know, research with very strong designs, like randomized clinical trials and so on. And I'm going to return to that kind of at the end of this. But I just wanted to kind of put the point out there that we fund lots of different kinds of what I think of as sort of research activities. We fund lots of analyses. But we also um, collect a lot of data, put out data sets. And then we spend a lot of effort and um, um, you know, and money, too, involved in sort of different research dissemination activities. So there's a whole sort of, you know, um, pipeline of research activities that funders get involved in in, um, in different places. And I think there, you know, there are moments where, there, you know, sort of like I think about sort of having a, a golf, I don't play golf, but a bag with different clubs and you pull out the right club for the right moment. I, I wouldn't be good at this if I were golfing, but, you know, there are certain moments that call for certain kinds of research activities. And so we, you know, we pull them out. And a lot of my work has been in coverage. And the foundation's actually been involved in um, coverage for, you know, 40 years really since we've been around. I've been there for five years. And in my time uh, directing coverage activities at the foundation, there are you know, there's not a research activity we haven't funded. We were, you know, one of the many uh, people that were proud to support the Oregon Medicaid experiment, but we also supported, you know, many, many other kinds of research activities. Some of them investor, investigator initiated, but then we funded lots of surveillance projects to sort of help people figure out how is health reform working? Can we see any changes? You know, really it's just sort of basic good descriptive information that's, that's framed in certain ways so that people can really understand and keep track of what's going on. We did some really novel, I think, um, surveillance projects, including um, a, uh, a, a series of studies to use a secret shopper methodology. I'm giving a shout out to Karen Rhodes, who I know is right here, which was, I think, a really important way to track what was going on with people's access to health care as, as coverage expanded. We've had some interesting partnerships with the private sector. You know, I've worked with Athena Health and used different kinds of data sources. We've funded challenges, competitions, so on and so forth. All different, you know, all different kinds of things, sort of depending on what the, you know, what the opportunity called for. And I think something that's a real challenge to funders is trying to figure out what the impact is of the different kinds of research activities that we fund. And that's something that it's, you know, it, you can't do an RCT on that, unfortunately. So we uh, really try to look for different kinds of, of signs that the things that we're funding are influencing people's thinking and hopefully influencing um, policy making. That's sort of the holy grail for us. So um, one thing about funders, I think, is that we tend to have, you know, compared to the government, which I guess is another big funder of research, I think our strength is that we have a lot of flexibility and we can be quick and we'll do a lot of different kinds of things. I think our weakness is that we, um, you know, we tend to be a little bit um, maybe short 
short term in our thinking. We, we sometimes, I think, resist going big on, you know, bigger studies with stronger designs that take longer and cost more. I think we're really locked into sort of day-to-day -day events and we think a lot about, you know, what's the next thing to do and I think we're kind of incrementalists in that way. So, you know, it's obviously been um, kind of an interesting couple of weeks for people that are interested in coverage. So between, you know, recent events and, and being here and, and thinking about all the work you guys do, I think it, it's been a good time for me to sort of, you know, take, take a step back and think about, um, okay, you know, what, what would be some, I think, useful kinds of research with sort of stronger designs that, that would make sense to be prioritizing right now if you are a healthcare funder, which, which I am. So I thought I would just throw a few of those things out there to you to see what you think and hopefully not use up all my time so that we can then, you know, get, get some back and forth and I can hear some ideas. So, you know, I'm pretty interested in insurance. So the first couple of things I'm going to talk about, um, you know, are in that realm. And obviously, the first one I'm going to mention is, is coverage. There have been some really important studies that I think have tried to really measure the impact of gaining health insurance. I mean, there's the, the Oregon study, which, you know, obviously had a really strong design and I think did a good job of, of making the case for coverage. It, um, it, the results were nuanced and some people, you know, saw different things in them, but it was really, really helpful for people that are trying to sort of make the case for coverage. And then there have been some other, I think, really, really important studies that have been done lately. There were a series of studies that used consumer credit data to show the impact of Medicaid expansion on people's um, people's debts and debt collection, and I think that's really helpful to show some of the economic benefits of, of gaining coverage. There have been some studies that have shown the long-term benefits to people that were enrolled in Medicaid as children, and I think that that's, you know, also really important, and there's been some work that's shown, you know, Medicaid expansion hasn't led to a reduction in employment, which is another thing that, that comes up. So these are important studies with good designs that I think help to sort of make the case for high rates of health insurance coverage. But I think there's opportunities to, you know, this is a particularly important time to try to make that case. So I think it's, it's important to think about whether there are other kinds of approaches that we could use to try to look at some of the, the effects of gaining coverage. I also, I got to admit, have started to think a little bit about um, thinking about that the other way around and thinking about 10 care and disenrollment and thinking about that natural experiment, which I think was, you know, a really, really important study that showed the impacts of losing coverage. And, um, you know, I, I hope that our immediate future doesn't give us lots of, you know, great opportunities to do um, natural experiments like that, but I, I think um, it is important to frame the issue that way sometimes too, because we know that people have sort of, you know, loss aversion or whatever you economists talk about, people sometimes can see the negative consequences of something and it's really more motivating. So I think it's a good time to maybe dust off those old 10 care studies that you have somewhere in your office and look at that, you know, what happens when a lot of people lose coverage. And I don't know if there are any other great examples of a population to look at now, and I, and I hope there won't be one in the future. But I've certainly been thinking about disenrollment as, as an interesting issue. Another insurance topic that's really important that I think Wes is going to talk about after I'm done talking is the issue of take up. And, you know, clearly we've had some problems with, um, you know, insufficient take up in the, you know, the experience that we've been having with the individual market. So I think, um, you know, Wes is going to talk about a really interesting experiment that he was able to do because he collaborated with a state exchange. And that's, you know, we don't know how much longer those kinds of opportunities are going to be around, but that is one of the, you know, unique places where you actually can do something semi-experimental. I think there could be a possibility of partnering with a carrier. Um, there could be, um, you know, maybe some laboratory simulations or, you know, things that you could do to sort of look at what, what are some ways to make the case for insurance to people that might increase the take-up rate and what are some things that work better than others. So I think that's, um, that's another area, I think. And a related topic is plan choice. You know, we had a, um, you know, a spirited debate, those of us who were interested in exchanges over the last couple of years about whether it really mattered to have standardized plans or whether people should have more choice and maybe good decision support. and you know, some people felt like people were overwhelmed by too much choice and pointed to examples of people making wrong choices. You know, other people 
felt like that might stifle innovation. Anyway, those conversations don't seem super relevant right now because frankly, all those plans were standardized and were pretty good plans and it you know, maybe didn't matter that much. And I don't think people could find huge differences between states that standardized and states that didn't, although it does affect how many products go on the market. So there's, there's something a little bit important about that, but for different reasons anyway. We may be entering an era where there are more kinds of variations in the insurance plans that are available on the individual market. So I think it would be important to, to do more research to better understand, you know, how can we support consumer decision making as, as well as we can? And what are some ways that help consumers understand sort of the true attributes of different plans, you know, particularly in maybe an environment that's, that's less regulated. So I think that that's also something that, you know, maybe could be worked on. I'm trying to think about where you could do a study with a strong design in these different areas. I mean, of course, there are laboratory setups. Maybe this could be something that a private exchange could offer some opportunities to look at different sort of choice environments. And so, you know, maybe state employee benefits, something like that. So I think that's another important issue as well. And another one I really care a lot about is benefit design. And that's, um, you know, not just the individual market, but this is something that there have been, I think there have been some really good studies of high deductible plans in different settings and they've shown some cases where they're able to control for selection and there have been some studies that have shown how high deductible plans affect utilization and those have been really important. But I think that we need to know more about what kinds of health impacts there are from different kinds of, uh, you know, benefit designs, especially plans that might make people utilize less because of the, the deductible and so on and so forth. And also whether there are certain kinds of um, decision-making aids that could be incorporated in these plans that might help consumers make better decisions. And that could be something where there could be opportunities to test things with carriers, large employers. I'm not going to design the whole studies right now. I'm just thinking about sort of, you know, where you might be able to do this. But I think that's important too. So that's my bucket on insurance. And now I was going to talk a little bit about delivery system innovations, which I know is kind of the, the heart of what people here are working on. Um, you know, and there, I'm not going to say anything that's shocking here. I'm going to talk about things that you all care about too. But I am going to say that if you if we may be entering a time where some choices about what we do with public money become harder to make, I think it sort of raises the stakes on some of these projects because the things that you guys are working on a lot, I think, have to do with things that are largely publicly funded and are, are quite expensive. So I think it's, it's important, you know, more important than ever to figure out, you know, what are the most effective kinds of delivery system innovation. So here I'm talking about interventions geared at high cost patients. So I know you're doing important work with the Camden Coalition that I hope I get a chance to hear about, but that's a good example. But there are, you know, many, many, many high utilizer interventions out there and they have different attributes and I know that that makes the, the study of them very hard because they're all different and it affects, you know, generalizability and, you know, how exactly they might work in other places. But they tend to share some features that we talk a lot about at our foundation without really knowing so much about what the evidence is for them. And one of them is intensive case management, like patient-centered medical home models. The other is the integration of behavioral health and, and uh, physical health, which, you know, we talk about a lot too. And, you know, and the other thing is using sort of health dollars to fund other things related to sort of social determinants of health like housing and so on and so forth. So I think there's a lot of energy and interest in these, in these kinds of topics and I know there are a lot of studies going on to look at them but I think it's sort of more important than ever that we, we start to figure out what are the best investments. Related is um, something I've been really interested in and think holds a lot of promise but I don't think the evidence is really there yet and that is uh, um, telehealth, particularly mobile applications for behavioral health, which, you know, potentially could offer a lot of promise to people and, you know, potentially could be something that if they were shown to really work, there could be ways they could be scaled up even, even by the safety net or even by, you know, in other ways to really improve population health. But I don't think that we, we know nearly as much as we need to know about them yet. And another related topic, just something I think is, is, you know, consuming a lot of resources and really, really important is substance abuse treatment, you know, the best way to administer medication-assisted treatment so that you get the best results, and that's something that consumes a lot of, a lot of budgets. 
So those are my delivery system items. And I'm gonna shift to one other thing that I actually think is a growing area of interest for us and you know maybe for you guys too, but I would be curious to know what you think about it. Okay, and that's the workplace, the workplace. So I know you have a couple workplace wellness demonstrations projects going on here. I think that's great. I, I'm, I'm surprised at how sort of unsettled the evidence about workplace wellness still is and how vociferously it gets argued by different people. I think there are some very serious or I'd say non-trivial sort of legal problems that people have brought up about workplace wellness. And I kind of think that's something that I sort of think about on one hand, but on the other hand, I'm sort of interested to know whether any of the incentives or when, whether any of these programs affect employee health. And if, you know, what we know about that, and then if, if they end up um, becoming sort of uh, disfavored for maybe legal reasons, is there, are there other ways to make those kinds of interventions available to people if in fact they, they could be helpful? So I think that's a very, very interesting area, but that does not exhaust my interest in the workplace. There's a couple other things I want to mention. Another, I think employees are, are getting more and more interested in the health of their employees. So I think there are a few other things that, that bear some consideration. Another one of them is um, like environmental modifications in the workplace that employers make. You may have read about UCSF removed all um, sweetened beverages or, or something from their whole campus and their whole environment. And I think they do have an evaluation in place of that. But I think there are a lot of other opportunities to look at the impact of different kinds of environmental modifications that employers might make. It kind of goes along with some of the interest. Um, you know, we work a little bit with the CEO roundtable on cancer. And there's uh, sort of a designation of a I can't remember the, I think a gold, a gold something employer that has created a set of environmental modifications combined with some benefit provisions that are sort of the, the ultimate for a sort of cancer prevention and being ready to treat cancer. So, you know, there's similar kinds of things that employers can do. And it's interesting to know what effect do they have? Are they something that we should be willing to encourage or reward? And, you know, what do we know about those? I think that's important. And my final thing, which um, I know I'm getting close to using Despite professing to be very interested in what you all said, I'm about to exhaust all the time. So the last thing I want to say really, really quickly is um, uh, paid, paid sick time and paid family leave, I think, is another thing. And this is something that you can look at. Like Chipotle kind of interested a lot of us by putting in paid sick time. And there are, I think, some potential opportunities for, for randomization. Maybe if you collaborate with an employer that has a lot of franchises that are similar in some ways. And, and different than others, and these are also things that, um, you know, that that cities do that you could look at at that level too. But I think looking at it at the employer level could be could be fruitful. And I think I'll I'll stop there. I would have said one more thing, but I don't need to. I'm going to stop and and use the time and see if anybody else has any ideas because that's primarily what I want to do is collect ideas. Thanks. Thank you. Could could you speak to? the dynamism that's associated with capacity in places, both provider capacity, gov governmental, municipal capacity, relative to treatment provision. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one question uh, for you. Uh, the, the second one is, uh, you have mentioned, or very few of the speakers today mentioned the role of faith or belief or ideas relative to what undergirds or motivate certain populations to do one thing or another. Because faith or belief in a higher ideal could, could transform a lot of different things if it is done in, in coordination with uh, multiple institutions, both public and private. Because let me just say that innovation is like taking one's hand and going across a chalkboard to bureaucrats and government workers because it's like every time you do something, we will wait out the next idea. And so, and, and government changes slowly. So therefore, if you got an idea- It's changing pretty quickly lately for me, but, well, but I hear you. At the, at the state level and, and, the, and the regional level, where, where I live in, in, in Hale, uh, ideas are wonderful, but how you actually do them and sustain them a long time and deal with the local, state, and municipal politics and the turf that's associated with so many different groups doing what they have done, that's also a part of the challenge and the problem. And so there's a dynamism that's taking place on the ground 
that I think that it gets into the how you do it. It's, it's beautiful to say it's important we need to do these things, but the how uh, is, is more critical to a practitioner and an administrator from my standpoint. I think uh, you know your point about faith is, is interesting and we do try, we have some new partnerships at the foundation with faith-based organizations to see how that might be a mechanism to get people to engage in more healthy behaviors and things like that, so I think that's important. And I think the, the point about capacity I, is, I think immediately of small employers and the difference between you know what they're able to do for their workers versus large employers. So I think those are important points and some of these solutions will not be useful for everyone. Um, so I liked a lot of the uh, issues that you brought up. I'm wondering if you're doing any work around or would be interested in, so you said something about mobile health applications for behavioral health. Are you looking into mobile health applications in other aspects, for example, patient navigation and or telemedicine, that sort of thing, um, so increasing access um, for sort of vulnerable populations? We haven't yet. It's a really huge field, so it's it's we haven't gotten too involved in it yet. I think behavioral health appeals to us because that's a big shortage area. So it seems like you know that and maybe things that help people in rural areas. I think those are two places that we might look first. But I think we're um, you know we're interested in the evidence there in general. We you know we get pitched all the time by different people that have different apps and. There's a lot of buzz around that, but I don't think we, we know yet sort of, you know, what it does to people's health and what we should be willing to pay for it. Yes? I'm wondering if you all um, have entertained uh, or, in fact, supported any um, kind of evaluation on the um, challenge that we are facing, we currently face, but that's going to be exponentially greater around older adults. And the fact that we are keeping everyone longer, we have incredible, you know, clinical capacity, medical capacity, but we are, we don't have the uh, supports, really, the long-term care kind of supports, the uh, community health worker or, or some other kind of, you know, uh, long-term services supports. We don't have the housing for them. They aren't saving money, so they're going to be on the street. I mean, are you looking at this kind of perfect storm that's coming together? It, it is an area we're interested in. I think um, we, were, we were hoping to, to be able to work on long-term care and long-term care insurance. Uh, right now, I don't, I don't know the pathway to that yet, but I think you know, we're concerned about um, caregiver burden and um, you know, what's going to happen when long-term services budgets and Medicaid maybe get shrunk, what, what's going to happen. So, so it is an issue and I think we're, you know, we're going to be looking for opportunities to make a contribution there. I think there's potentially roles for technology there as well that we haven't you know, really studied that much yet. Should I stop? Oh, I see a question back there. Can I take one more? Let's take that last, last, last one. Sorry. Um, I'm curious to hear more about uh, what part of the research effort you usually look for for you have uh, to fund and have funded in the past. So my experience collaborating uh, with implementing partner, I'm a researcher, collaborating with implementing partner is that there are some funding sources on the research side and there's some funding sources on the uh, service delivery that the implementing partners are getting either from the government, from the private sector, or from funders. One missing piece we really run into is for the implementing partners to have built the data infrastructure and the research infrastructure to make it easier for evaluation, not just for one project, but for potentially many projects. And I'm curious if that's something you guys have been interested in getting into or is looking into getting into. I'm not sure if that's really come up for us yet, but we could talk outside about that. That's, that's interesting. You could give me an example and you know, maybe fill me in a little bit more on that. But no, I was, you know, usually we are sort of more the, the research funders for, for things like this. And now um, I've been told that, that I'm done, and that's fine. I don't want to go around time. But feel free to contact me anytime with, you know, your ideas and suggestions, because really that's, that's what I would mostly like to, to come away from this conference getting. Thanks a lot. <laughs>